Brethren moderators, for the given Blakely and ladies and gentlemen, it pleases me greatly again to be before you tonight, and this time in the negative, of the proposition that he allegedly affects to affirm. I might point out to you that the issue here tonight, contrary to his original approach on it, is not, does the Spirit dwell in us? He could prove this over and over and over, and this is not the issue. He could prove that the Holy Spirit dwells in us personally, and this is still not accomplishing his obligation. Because his obligation is to prove that the Holy Spirit dwells in us personally, bodily, actually, and in his own person. The issue is not, does the Spirit dwell? The issue is, does he dwell personally, literally, bodily, and abstractly? Let him keep that in mind and quit quoting passages because it's a waste of his time and ours that asserts that which we do not deny. We believe the Holy Spirit is in us. And all of this effort to show that somebody questions that is simply dodging the real issue in this debate. Now to his questions quickly, and uh, before I deal with them, I'll present my questions here. Number one, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? In the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit by whose indwelling, the Christian is enabled to live a holy life, unquote. Two, do you believe that the Holy Spirit indwells me literally, personally, and actually? If yes, how do you know but what my understanding of the Scriptures is the right one rather than yours? If no, why do you quote Scripture to me at all since I couldn't understand it anyway if you think I don't have that indwelling? Remember now, that he believes that the word cannot be understood without a literal, personal, bodily indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Three, is belief in a literal and personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit essential to the receiving of it? Four, if the statement, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, means that the child of God is literally and actually indwelt with the Holy Spirit, does he who is joined to a harlot 1 Corinthians 6, 16, mean that the fornicator is literally indwelt by the harlot. If not, why not? What is the difference in the meaning of the phrases, word, the Word dwells in you, Christ dwells in you, and the Spirit dwells in you? Those are the questions, and we'll be happy to have Mr. Our brother Blakely deal with them. Number one, do you accept the fact that the Holy Spirit himself has contact with your spirit? Yes. The issue, friends, is not, is there a contact, but what kind of contact? Now, I can't present a finer statement on that than these words from Alexander Carmel, uh, which appear in his work, Christianity Restored. The tongue of the author and the pen of the writer, those small instruments and of little physical power, are the two most powerful instruments in the world because they are to the mind as the arms to the body. They are but the instruments of moral power. The strength is in what is spoken or written. The argument is the power of the spirit of man and the only power which one spirit can assert over another is its arguments. How often do we see a whole congregation rise into certain actions, expressions of joy or sorrow, by the spirit of one man. Yet no person supposes that his spirit has literally deserted his body and entered into every man and woman in the house. Although it is often said he has filled them with his spirit. But now how does the spirit located in the head of yonder little man, that is the speaker, fill all the thousands around him with joy or sadness, with fear and trembling, with zeal or indignation, as the case may be, how has it displayed such power over many minds? Answer, by words uttered by the tongue, by ideas communicated to the minds of the hearers. That's the way that the Spirit has contact with me. He gave the message. When I receive that message, I, has, I have contact with him. Romans 8 and 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of the sons of God. 
My knowledge of how to live as a son of God is set out in the sacred word. It follows, therefore, that when I am obedient to that word, I'm being led by the Spirit. That's the contact that the Spirit has with us, and so the book teaches. Number two, what is the meaning of 2 Peter 1, 19? Until the day dawn and the day shall rise in your hearts. This has reference to that hope that uh, surges out of us all, that's planted there by faith, not by direct operation of the Holy Spirit, but by faith in God's word of the ultimate triumph of the Lord's people. I suggest that you read my commentary. Uh, on the first Peter for a third discussion of that subject. Do you require the intercession of Christ at the right hand of God in addition to the word? Of course I do. I also require the efforts on the part of the Holy Spirit there at the throne of God in my behalf. Romans 8, 26 and 27. That doesn't have one solitary thing to do with the question of whether the Spirit is literally, bodily in us today. That's an influence wrought on God, not on us. It's strange that this man cannot see that. Our baptized believers really, sons of God, are only figuratively. There are some figures of speech that cannot be applied to certain relationships. Now, when we talk about being a son of God, that doesn't mean that we were physically begotten. I ask him, I turn the question to him, you claim to be a begotten son of God. Were you literally begotten by the Father biologically? Now, when you've answered that, you've got the answer to my question, or to your question. Number five, you acknowledge that the Holy Spirit was in Christ and in the apostles. Where is he now? Well, the Holy Spirit is deity. You might just ask, Christ was in the apostles. Now, where is Christ today? The apostles are all dead. Certainly, the power of the Holy Spirit, of the Father and the Son, are being manifest today to take the position that there's any hint in such a question to the support of the so-called indwelling is absurd. Now, he said, he's glad to know that I believe that the Spirit indwells us. Well, he had no reason to doubt that at the beginning. We said that in the first speech last night. He said the matter of the indwelling is not a question of mode. Now, friends, I have long ago observed that some men are so anxious to prove a point that they make themselves uh, ridiculous in so doing on other views. And he's done exactly that. Now, watch. He says it's not a matter of mode. The simple fact is the Spirit is in us, and that means he's in us personally, literally, bodily. All right, then if that be true in exactly the same phrase, when it's said that the Father is in us, then to say that this is not representatively, as they have themselves said, but that he's in us literally would follow from his argument. But no, he thinks that there is a mode involved in the question of the Father and the Son. Now, I ask you, friends, why is it that we take a statement that says the Father is I in in us and interpret that to mean that he's not in us literally, bodily, or personally. We find a statement that says that Christ is in us, and he interprets that to mean not literally, bodily, or personally. But when he comes to the same statement that the Spirit is in us, he disregards his interpretation or mood with reference to the Father and the Son and says, oh, no, the Spirit is in us literally, bodily, and actually. Now, let me point out to you this. Not tonight, not last night, not the rest of this evening, are from now to eternity. Will he cite a passage of Scripture that asserts that the Holy Spirit dwells in us personally, bodily, literally? It's just not there. And he knows it. Otherwise, he would have produced it. So he has not met the issue on his affirmation. He says now, and cites Hebrews 10:17 about the covenant being written in their hearts. But mind you, that was an acceptation of the teaching of the Lord by faith, not by an, uh, an intrusion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit provided the testimony on the basis of which that covenant exists. And so again, he has failed on that point. He said, why don't you preach if you believe that God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit's in us? Well, I preach it all over the country and have 
uh, much, much longer than he has, except that I preach the truth on it. And he teaches error regarding it. Now, he said, a person cannot dwell impersonally in one, by which he meant this, that in order for one person to be in, in another, he must be in him literally. All right? Now, Brother Blakely, is God literally in us? On last evening, you admitted, and in your writings or in the writings of your family, are statements that the Father dwells in us representatively. Now, I ask you, does the Father dwell in us impersonally or literally or actually? Does Christ dwell in us literally or actually or impersonally? And says, upon a reply to that. Now, he attempted to cite some statements that say that the Holy Spirit is in us and then attempted to inject the statement that this is not metaphorically. Well, all right, why not then take the statements that says that God's in us. He's either in us literally or he's in us metaphorically or figuratively. Now, which is it? Brother Blakely, look up here at me just for one moment. When you come back here, you tell us is the Father and the Son in us literally or metaphorically? Now, don't dodge that. You tell us which it is. We shall insist on knowing that. He says that to add to the Word of God is to modify it, and this, of course, is to destroy its effectiveness. I couldn't agree more. But he is the gentleman that is modifying it tonight. The book says that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are in us, but they nowhere say that they're in us bodily, personally, literally, or abstractly. He is adding that to it. And in so doing, he is modifying it, and we have his statement that a person that modifies the word destroys its effectiveness. And I couldn't agree more. Now that covers his speech, item by item, statement by statement. Now, he did throw three or four passages together here that assert that the Son is in us, or that the Spirit is in us, the Father is in us, about which there's no question, and about which I've already discussed time and again, did that again and again on last night. Now, I want to put on the screen now chart number 10. And, uh, uh, well, first of all, 9. Before we get to 10, we'll, we'll get to chart um, 9, which will make visibly clear to you what we are doing here tonight in this debate. Now, <clears throat> If you will observe here, I have on the chart, and uh, I think that Brother Blakely has a copy of this, at least he, sh he should have, give him a copy of this so he will see it here. I have here a diagram of the Godhead being in us. Now note here the passages. The Father is in us. 2 Corinthians 6 and 16, God dwells in us. Now I ask you, is that a literal bodily, bodily personal indwelling? Or is it a figurative one? When you call for this chart tonight, please answer that question. Secondly, the Father walks in us. I in in us. Is that a metaphorical or literal statement? Does the Father literally walk in us? Now tell us, Brother Blakely, when you come up here. The Father is said to dwell in us. 1 John 4 and 15, whosoever confesses, that Jesus has come in the flesh, God dwells in him, and he in God. Does God literally dwell in us? Do we literally dwell in God? Why it doesn't take a Solomon to see that this simply means as we live within the sphere of his will, that he is in us and we are in him. Now look again. Christ the Son is said to be in us. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Note, in Galatians 4 and 19, that he is formed in us. In us, formed in us. Is this a literal or figurative or metaphorical statement? And 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, we dwell in him. Do we live in him literally like we live in a house here on earth? Why, friends, it seems to me that ordinary simple intelligence would lead a person to see that one has to consider these statements as being figurative and metaphorical. Now you watch. There are a number of Greek locatives, that is, um, constructions of the Greek text that indicate this mode of existence. Six times in the Greek text, the Spirit is said to be in us. Sixteen times, Christ is said to be in us. 
six times or eight times the father is said to be in us. They're all in us in exactly the same way. How does Christ live in us? Ephesians 3 and 17, in our hearts by faith. Now, it's ridiculous to think about any one of them being in us and not all of them at the same time. It's not possible to have a part of the Godhead in you without all of the Godhead being in you. And since Christ comes into us by faith, and since the Spirit comes at the same time and in the same way, then the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit dwell in our hearts by faith, not literally, not bodily, not actually. As a matter of fact, I'm going to prove now that the manner in which the Spirit dwells in us is by means of the teaching he gave. Chart number 10 uh, will be our next one here. This chart here will enable us to see a contrast and at the same time a, com uh, a comment. We have literally here an apostolic commentary on uh, what it means to live in Christ and to have the word of Christ in us, and to have the spirit in us. Now, watch carefully the phraseology. It's not all on the chart, but I'm going to quote it. Ephesians 5, 19 reads, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Now, be filled. Mind you, that's an imperative. It's a present imperative. Literally, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's not a single shot filling that comes in to you as these... Uh, fellows think at uh, baptism or following baptism. This is a continuous deal through life. Be filled. Keep on being filled with the Spirit is the significance. Now watch. Be not drunk with wine when is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now watch a parallel from the pen of the same apostle. Identical in phraseology except for one phrase. Colossians 3 and 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Identical, except that in Ephesians 5, Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. In Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, does that mean that the word and the Spirit are the same? No, any more than the New Testament in Christ are the same. But it does mean that the way that the Spirit influences us is by means of the Word. I illustrate like this. A man takes an axe and he chops wood. He transmits the energy to the stick of wood through the axe. It's the man that has the energy and the power. The influence is wrought upon the wood. The instrument by which it's done is the axe. That's Paul's illustration in Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Holy Spirit uses that sword, which is the word of God, to cut to the heart upon those who are thereby influenced. Now let us have a chart 11, which will... I think settle this question with reference to the significance of the phrase in him. Here we have a number of statements involving the presence of deity in us, well within you. Now note what Thayer says about this phrase that's translated in him, native of person and one everywhere metaphorically. That's what Dr. Thayer says is the meaning, to dwell in one and influence him for good. And then uh, Arnold and Gingrich likewise say, figurative of the person of the divine word and of the spirit, and actually gives the passage that we're discussing. Now watch, friends. In Romans 8, 9, and 11, the spirit dwelleth in you. The phrase is the same. In uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, the spirit dwelleth in you. The phrase is the same. In Colossians 3 and 16, the word dwells in you. The phrase is exactly the same. In 1 Corinthians 5 and 1, there is fornication in you. Now, the translation is among you, but the Greek phrase is exactly the same. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, there is a fault in you. Among you is the translation. But then it's the same phrase. The apostle Paul said that the signs of apostle were in them. And the translation is among them, but the phrase is exactly the same. Now, I ask you, 
were the sons of the apostles in literally in every member of the Corinthian church? Well, anybody that has any concept of this at all knows that's not what it means. It means simply and solely that in, among them or in their presence was this. Not literally, not actually, not bodily. You get it, friends. Nowhere does the Bible say that the Spirit dwells in us literally bodily. He says to add to the Word of God is to destroy its effectiveness. He's done that here uh, tonight. Now, come up. Thank you.